Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. of mine, it's really appropriate in this time of thanksgiving to think of all the ways that we can bless the Lord for the things that he has done for us. So let's sing 10,000 Reasons Together.
Sing, come thou fount of every blessing.
your hat. <laughs> Let's sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Quail Lake Church Online. It's great to have you with us, and you know what? It's so good you're with us today because we're starting a brand new series. When we talk about a series, we're talking about starting a new book of the Bible because we take them one chapter at a time. There's a lot of stuff in it, but we get to cover a lot of ground. So you get exposure to a lot of the New Testament. And so we're going to do this today, start on the first chapter of Paul's first letter, to Timothy. Timothy was his protege, young man that he was discipling and became a co-worker of his. And so we're going to start with this, and, uh, and I hope you'll track with us because there's so much good stuff that is contemporary stuff. It'll be things that you'll be able to look back at the headlines today and say, yep, same stuff. Folks are just folks. You know, we're in this thing together, and even cultures and time and all of this, you wipe that away, it's the same deal. So, let's pray. We're going to get into this wonderful letter, which is a book here in the New Testament called 1 Timothy. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. You're a great and awesome God. We pray now that you would be with us, and Father, that you'd speak to us. Lord, all of us are coming here with different stuff, stuff that's happened to us, stuff we've done, stuff we've experienced, stuff we've remembered. All these things have touched our hearts, and I pray that right now, that you would reach down and remind us how loved we are. And that, Lord, you would take this, this letter here, this portion of the letter, and remind us that this is a love letter. And that, Lord, you're going to speak to us right now. So I thank you for that. I pray for each person watching that you'll encourage them, that, Father, you'll remind them again and again how loved they are, and that, Father, you'll bless them in a very special way by your Spirit. So we ask now that you would speak to our hearts and that we would have hearts that would be able to listen and hear what you're telling us. And we pray it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, there's a story of a rooster. And this rooster used to wake up every morning real early. And it was every morning of his life. And he would crow before the sun came up. And every morning after he started crowing, the sun would rise. And so as the months and years went by, the animals, the barnyard, would go to the rooster and say, Mr. Rooster, thank you so much for bringing up the sun each day. We are not worthy of all that you do for us. Well, the rooster thought, well, okay, there you go. And one day, though, he wasn't feeling well, and the rooster slept in, and guess what? The sun came up anyway. Well, the people came up to the rooster that day and said, you fraud. You weren't even out here today, and yet the sun came up anyway. Well, the rooster was kind of stunned by this and embarrassed and depressed and all of this, and then eventually he was relieved when he realized because he didn't bring the sun up, the world didn't depend on him. And as we begin this letter, one of the things we're going to learn is that the world doesn't depend on you. They need you. They need your love. But we need to depend on this Jesus of the Bible. And so that's what Paul is going to be telling Timothy. And we're going to take a look at this right now and begin this together. Now, who's Timothy? Well, if you go back to the book of Acts, another book in the New Testament, in Acts 16, we find out that Paul met this young man, Timothy, and when he was traveling through a city called Lystra. And he discovered that this Timothy was a, was a good young man. He was a a guy who was God-fearing and all of this stuff. His mom was Jewish, and she had become a follower of Jesus. Dad was a Greek, so it was a mixed marriage, and that was a big deal in those days. Greeks and Jews, this was a, this was a big kind of crossover. But uh, Dad, we don't know anything about his faith. But people spoke highly of young Timothy and all of this, and Paul said, this is a kid that, you know, I think God could really use. So Timothy was with Paul in Corinth, another city in that area, in the winter of 57 and 58, and he wrote the letter to the Romans at that time. And then uh, Timothy was with Paul in Macedonia, 
back in 58. We can kind of gauge these dates. And he left the city before Paul, and he was going to wait for Paul in Troas. Now, when this epistle, which is a letter, was written, Timothy was a church leader in the city of Ephesus. And if you remember, there is a letter to the Ephesian church. And we've done that one already. And so what he's saying is that, hey, you know what? There's some maybe who are doubting your leadership. But here's how I want you to leave. And so we're probably now about A.D. 64, 65, which means the Apostle Paul is very close to his death. He's going to be executed by the Romans for going against the status quo. So that's a little background for us. And we're going to begin our journey through 1 Timothy with this. He says, I am Paul. I am Paul. Every time I see that, I think I am Groot. But, you know, he says, I am Paul. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ. Christ Jesus appointed by God, the command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus who gives us hope. I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. May God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. So this is how we begin. Paul begins this letter to Timothy, reminding him of who he is. Now, he's done this when he sends his letters out because he is going to speak on behalf of God. Now, why should he be talking about, you know, hey, this is what God says and all of that? Well, he says, I'm an apostle, apostle appointed by the command of Jesus Christ. Now, the term apostle, when they used it there, is very specific. And when we see it in the book of Acts, uh, you know, that's a key thing. There was something specific about who was called an apostle. Now, apostle had to be someone who had actually seen Jesus after the crucifixion and the resurrection. So it wasn't a case of, I believe it because I didn't see it and all of this, I have faith. No, you had to see him. That's the first thing. The second thing was you had to have a direct commission by Jesus where he says, you go preach the good news. You go and tell the folks what it's all about. So that was it. Now, what about the Apostle Paul? Why is he an apostle? You know, the resurrection took place. And I didn't hear any Easter stories about the Apostle Paul. Jesus, if you look in the book of Acts, after uh, 40 days, we find that he has ascended into heaven. He's gone up and there, we got stuff going on there. Where's Paul? Well, he became the poster boy for the status quo. Now, remember, if you're a Jesus person, you're a rebel. You're a rebel. You're not status quo. You're going against the flow on this. But what this Paul is going to do, he's going to single-handedly stop this Jesus movement. And one of the things he does, he goes to a city called Damascus. He's going to put Christians in chains, bring them back for trial, all of this. And, you know, he's got this whole thing. And on the road to Damascus, all of a sudden, he's put down in the dirt by, guess who? Jesus himself. And he's scared to death because there's this unworldly light in the middle of the day that comes. The people around him are just blown away. They go, what's happening to us? And, and all of a sudden, he hears a voice. The others heard a sound, but not the voice. And he says, why are you persecuting me, Paul? He says, I, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. And he goes, oh, oh, I was on the wrong side the whole time. So Jesus says, you're going to be on my team, but you're going to suffer for it. And on top of that, Jesus blinds him. Can't see. Pretty tough commissioning ceremony, I'd say. You know, you're in the dirt. You're laying there. I'm telling you, you're going to suffer for me. And then you're blinded on top of that. Your whole world just fell apart. Well, Jesus appeared to him in a dramatic way. He commissioned him then to not go to his people, to go to the enemy, to the Gentiles. Wow. Now, you know, you hear people today talk about, you know, they've seen Jesus maybe, and, and maybe they've been given the same kind of authority as the apostles of the Bible have and such. And, you know, I, I don't know about that. I, you know, when I hear that, I think about True Grit. You ever seen that movie? True Grit with Robert Duvall and John Wayne. At the very end, they have a showdown and such. John Wayne turns to Robert Duvall. They're on horses looking at each other. And he says, Ned, I mean to take you into court, to so-and-so court, and to have you hang by your neck till you're dead. And Robert Duvall looks at him and he says, bold talk for a one-eyed fat man. Well, you know what? 
Sometimes when people say that, it says, hey, I've got this position, everything. Well, maybe so, but it's kind of bold talk. Because historically for an apostle, there's not much in the way of accolades by the world. There's no earthly gain. And if it's like the earthly, early ones, it's going to be filled with pain, persecution, and prison. That's what they all experienced. That's what the Apostle Paul's experienced. So he's writing from somewhere to this one who's been like a son to him. Some people say Rome. Some people say he's in Macedonia. We're not sure where he is now. But he's lived this life of physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse and hardship. And in understanding all of that, look how he finishes his description of Jesus. He says, you know, I'm an apostle by the command, the direct command of Jesus himself. And he's the Jesus who does what? Gives us hope. Hope. That's what he's talking about. You know, we have a, a kid's thing we call a wana, and it go, we have an alarm that goes off on my phone at 6.50 in, uh, in the evenings. And, and every time that goes off while we're doing our lessons in Awana, we stop. And I have it to remind me, and I want to remind the kids, it's 6.50, which is 10 to 7. Because Mark 10.27 says, with men it is impossible, not so with God. With God, all things are possible. I want kids to know that and hold on to that because our God can do anything, which means he holds the door open to hope. You know, we've seen such a decline in life and values and freedom in our country over the years, and it's happening all over the world. And where there used to be hope, there's now a spirit of fear, and a sense our best days are way behind us. That's what happens when you trust human wisdom, human morality, and human justice. But with God, there's always hope. Not just for heaven, not just eternity, but hope right now. Hope right now when people turn to the God of the Bible. Well, when they change, will everything be perfect? No, it won't be. Well, why not? Well, because people are still in charge. People are still in charge, but it gets better. So he begins his instructions to Timothy, verse 3. When I left for Macedonia, I urge you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions and myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations, which don't help people live a life of faith. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. But some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. Well, here's where things become unraveled. Paul tells Timothy to stop. Stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. There'll always be those teachers who go away from what God has said. He said it's a waste of time. All they're getting are myths, meaningless speculations. And none of this is going to help you live a life of faith in God. Paul says this is his purpose. His purpose is this, that believers would be filled with love. It comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. And in verse 6, he says, they missed the whole point of it. That's the whole point of what this is all about, of what God is trying to do. They're missing what's supposed to be job one. And what they do is focus on the meaningless discussion. So he says, remember about the law. And he says, the laws are for the unforgiving. Really? Verse 8, now we know that the law is good when it's used correctly. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The laws for people who are sexually immoral, who practice homosexuality or slave trader, liars, promise breakers, or do anything else that contradicts wholesome teaching. And that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. He tells about the law. The law of Moses, that was the key for the Jewish people. The law exists not for people who do what is right, he says, but for those who continue in their sin. 
Now, did you hear that list? You've got to really look at it to go back on it. But what Paul is doing is he's following the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, the first set, is the first four commandments. Disobedient, those who can't be taught. Rebellious, those who can't be disciplined. The ungodly, who show no reverence for God. The sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy. Then the second set is the next six commandments. Those who murder their father or mother, the ultimate act of dishonoring your parents. Those who murder other people, breaking the command to not murder. Those who are sexually immoral, a homosexual, dealing with adultery, all of it is sexual sin. Slave traders, also translated kidnappers. That's the worst form of theft. That's stealing people. Liars and oath breakers. Those are violate the commandment that you don't bear false witness. You don't lie. And then those who do anything else that contradicts the right teaching covers everything we might have missed. You see what this is? The law of God is not a prescription. It's a description. It's an analysis of who we are. It's not that this is how you get well. This is how you get right with God. No, no. It's none of that. All the law does is you look at it and you say, I'm sunk. I can find me there in most of these places. What do I do? It's meant to put us face to face with what our problems are. And there's nothing here to solve it. The prescription, you know, the medicine, the cure, it's not there. There's nothing there. And that's the trouble. People look at the law. They, I hear people tell me, you know, well, you know, I try to obey the Ten Commandments. And you know what? You can't. You can't obey the Ten Commandments because nobody can do it. What it does is that it's just there to show us who we really are, to show us our, how desperate our situation is. And that's why people hate the Bible because we want to do what we want to do. I get that. I'm sinner enough to understand that. But the world situation is to look at this, stick their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 I don't want to hear anything. And the world crumbles all around them because of them. And they don't understand it till it's too late. So the question comes back to what Paul started off with. Is there any hope? Is there any real hope? Well, he talked about this hope in Jesus Christ. And you know one of the things I believe? I believe that most people out there are living lives of quiet desperation. We don't share that with anybody else. But we, we've got this quiet, desperate, we're desperate on the inside. And that's why I think they have to silence all other voices because it might force us to face that which is inside of us. Face the truth about life, death, and who we really are. Now remember, what you need to believe in is good news. And this good news is not about condemnation. We're all under condemnation. It's not a case, well, you know, these people aren't going to be condemned and these, these aren't. We're all condemned. It's just who's going to get rescued? Anybody who wants to. And Paul says, it happened to me. I went from being a mess to being an object of mercy. Listen to what he says, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. And even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with me as even the worst sinners. And all others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king and unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Paul loved to tell his story. And it's an amazing story. And when he tells it, there's a sense that we see where you came from. We see this is kind of a mess, wasn't it? He knew. He knew when he came to Christ, he'd been on the wrong side of history. 
And if this Jesus had not personally confronted him, he would be lost to history and to eternity. And you know, the way he starts this, too, in the Greek is with, thanks I have, because thanks was the focus word. He says, I'm just so grateful. I am so grateful, because it was grace, the grace of God that had been given to me, been shown to me, that had motivated me. And in this sight, he showed, he, he said, you know what? God took me from zero to hero. That was an awesome thing about what this God did. Now listen again to how he describes himself. Blasphemer, persecutor, violent man. Now he wasn't deliberately disobeying God, saying, I'm going to go out and disobey God today. He says, I did it because I didn't know any better. He was the most sincere man out there. He was going to protect God, protect what they believed already. The problem was he was sincerely wrong. And that's the problem with a lot of sincere people is because you're sincere doesn't make you right. So this passage is a warning for us because each one of us, we could be there. We could be really sincere. Are you right, though? That's the key. We could still do wrong. And all the while, we're totally convinced, nope, I'm on the right track. Well, what if you are wrong? What happens if in good faith you're out there, you're doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing? Well, look what happened to Paul. God will probably do the same thing to you. He'll knock you down, put you in the dirt, and set you straight. Paul was completely turned around because God said, you're worth it. God was gracious to him and to us, so much so that in the Greek, he says, I can't even put this into words. He had to make up a word. He put two words together. See how wonderful it was, and then he nails it. He says, Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. You know, there was a huge bestseller that was entitled years ago, I'm okay, you're okay. It was on the uh, New York Times bestseller list for 20 plus years. And the theme was just what the title says. Hey, you're okay, I'm okay, don't worry, be happy. The problem is, that's not what the Bible says. Listen to what it says, Romans 3.23. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And he says that God used his just evil life, and his life was, it turned out to be evil, Paul, and he turned it into something good. And he said, you know why God did that? He saved me as an example to everyone else, because you see how bad I was, how far I had fallen, but I'm an example of what God can do. I'm an example of what God can do. So he says to Timothy, "Uh, we're going to be fighting for Jesus, and I want you to do it. Verse 18, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. I'm Aeneas and Alexander are two examples. I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so that they might learn to not blaspheme God. Whoa, we got down to it right there. Sounds like a bar fight, doesn't it? Paul tells his student and co-worker, hold the line. Hold the line. Don't move. Don't give in. What are you saying to Timothy, too, pretty much is, I believe in you. I believe in you. Because God has equipped you. In a real sense, by doing that, God says he believes in you, too. He says, fight the Lord's battles. See, Christians, sometimes we portray ourselves and others as, you know, we're kind of, Meek and mild, kind of just sit in the corner and, you know, all of this. No, you're, you're warriors. You're warriors for God. You're fighting not for yourself, for the people of earth and many of those who hate you. But we do it because we know how high the stakes are. And then he says, keep your conscience clear. Now, here's the problem with your conscience. Your conscience is like a computer. It comes with a godly default program. It's built in there. We know right from wrong, which means in order for us to live with ourselves, sometimes when we sin is to reprogram ourselves, reprogram our consciences. That's how we justify all the stuff you see out there in the world. He says, don't let anybody hijack your conscience. Keep it fresh and alive. And you do that with a close relationship with Christ, and especially being in that Bible. 
And he says, people have deliberately violated their consciences until that voice of God can hardly be heard. And then he talks about these two yahoos, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He says, this is what I'm talking about. He says, you remember these guys? Yep, these guys, they're the poster boys for screwing up their faith on purpose and then trying to do it to others. And Paul says, I threw them out. Out the door you go and turn them over to Satan so they might, not, so they might learn to not blaspheme God. And they had the judgment of God upon them. You know what the judgment of God is? It's on our whole nation now. Are people going to explode? Are they turn into fire? Are they going to get sick? No. If only it were that simple. In Romans 1, it says what the judgment of God is on people, on cultures, and on nations. Listen to what it says. So God abandons them to do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's the judgment of God. He stands back, and that's what happened to Hymenaeus and, and Alexander. He just says, nope, God's going to stand back and let you take the consequences of your actions. You get to do whatever you want, and then you reap what you sow. So, what do we do with this? Two reminders here. It comes out with guns blazing. Two things we want to do it. First, have you ever seen a kid try to hide, especially if they've done something wrong, or maybe they're playing hide and seek or something like that? They want to hide with you. What do they do? They put their head under a blanket. Have you seen that before? Sometimes small dogs will do that as well. They just is if I can if I can't see you, you can't see me. I've done the hide and seek thing with my kids and my grandkids. And they're just amazed. How did you see me? You know, I had this over my head. The world operates a lot like that. The truth is out there staring us in the face about who we are, about the fact that all of us will leave this planet, and about the fact we're all dealing with guilt. But what we do is we just throw the blanket over our heads and declare, I'm safe. Nothing can touch me. And it isn't true. The people of our world have one choice on this planet that will be made consciously or unconsciously. Do I put myself under the care of the God of the universe or not? When we pull away from God, then we're on our own. We're on our own. God says, I don't want you to be on your own. I'm here. I want you to be with me for now and for eternity. Second thing is, you need to remember, if you're trying to work your way, and the way that is, not even religiously, just say, I'm going to be a good person. You're not even going to be close. So wait a minute, there are lots of good people out there. Let me tell you a story. My dad loved to play baseball. And uh, when he was a kid, he was playing in an elementary school league in Dallas, Texas. And this was in the early 30s and such and, and so forth. And, and so he said, we had this one team that had a kid. Now we're fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Nobody could hit this pitcher. It was incredible. Nobody could do it. Well, they did some research, and they found out. I remember this fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders. The pitcher's 15 years old. He's going on 16. Now, they weren't cheating because in those days, what they would do in elementary school was if you couldn't pass a certain standard, you got held back. Well, what if you couldn't do it the next year? You got held back till you got it, and then we pass you along. This kid, maybe he was a sixth grader, he was 15 years old. He's going to be driving next year, but he's in the sixth grade. Now, this kid, he was an all-star against fourth graders, fifth graders, and sixth graders. I mean, he would have been, wow, this guy's awesome. Really? How about putting him up against the Yankees of the 1930s? Let's put him on the mound there and see what he does. He's going to be on Boston Red Sox team. He's going to pitch to the whole Yankee uh, crew there, including Babe Ruth. How well do you think that kid's going to do? Are you kidding? Babe Ruth gets 60 home runs that day off of him. You see what happens to us is when we talk about goodness, what we're doing is we lower our standard way down. You look good if you're pitching against children. You don't look so good if you're playing in the major leagues at 15. And that's what happens to us. 
We talk about how good, how gracious, uh, how wonderful we think we are. We're using a pretty low bar of conduct and righteousness. When we're confronted with the righteousness of Christ, it's literally a whole new ball game. Now, we live pretty close to the Pacific Ocean out here in California, in the, in the Central Valley. And you know, the Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean on this planet. And every now and then, if you go over to the coast and you read the local papers, you find that somebody was out there and they were in distress and we got these brave lifeguards and, and he or she will run out there and they'll save the person. They'll have an article in the paper about them. Or maybe some good Samaritan will go out there and rescue this person. Now, when they tell the story, they never say, Johnny was out swimming 200 yards from shore and he got cramps. He couldn't go any farther and he was in distress. And then they don't, they don't do this. They don't say, it hasn't been confirmed, but authorities suspect that Johnny was actually trying to swim from Cayucas to the Hawaiian Islands. What? What did we dream that was happening? That's stupid. That's ludicrous. 200 yards off the coast? That's not going to get you to Maui. It's 2,500 miles away across the Pacific. And that's the way it is with us. The life we want, the happiness we want, the joy we want, the future we want, we can't do it. And what we do is instead we lower our standards and rejoice that, well, we're actually good people doing good things. And there are a lot of nice people out there. But compared to the righteousness of Christ, everybody in heaven would be laughing at us if it weren't so tragic. We can't even come close. We can't even come near that. That's why we depend on the grace of God. And as the old hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. His blood for the payment of our sin. His righteousness laid over for us so we can stand faultless before the God of the universe. Well, I know all the things you did. God says, I forgot everything you did. Because you're righteous in my sight. Because you carry the righteousness of Christ. What do you need to do? All you have to do is trust Him. That's the good news we're bringing to the world. Get on board. Rescue ship is here. We want you to come with us. Sail home to heaven itself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You're a great and awesome God. And we thank you for this wonderful letter. And Lord, we thank you for the way that Paul comes out shooting. And Lord, we pray that you would remind us that you have got good stuff for us. And the message is you love us so much. That you want us to be with you in heaven. You want us to be able to enjoy this life. You want us to be able to live a life that is greater than what we can imagine, that is something that has so much more value than we try to give to ourselves. And it comes from Christ and from that cross. And so, Lord, I pray today, if there are people watching today, and maybe you haven't made that decision, or maybe you maybe you have, and you strayed away, and you said, man, my, I haven't done anything about this in years. And, well, today's the day you come back, or to come to Christ. And the way you start is just by going, Lord, Lord, I, okay, I'm going to get on board. I'm going to trust that you are going to save me from my sins. And so I'm going to ask now that you would, you would just forgive me. Forgive me. I'm going to trust what you did on the cross forgives me for my sins. I want that to count for me. I want you to come into my heart. And Lord, I'm ready to follow after you. And I'm going to follow you here, follow you all the days I've got, and I'm going to follow you right into heaven itself, into an eternity. When you do that, God says, welcome home. Welcome to the team. You're a player now. It's great to have you aboard. But if maybe you've strayed away, maybe you say, man, things have gone cold in my life. You know, I just kind of, I don't know what happened to me. Then God says, you can come home. You can always come home. That, that door is always open. It's never barred. And all you need to do is say, Lord, I'm back. I want you to come in. And I want to reaffirm what you've done for me. And I'm ready to serve you follow you now. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your goodness and grace. And I pray for each one today. Pray that you'll fill them with the hope of Jesus Christ and bless them richly. We pray it. In the wonderful name of Jesus himself, amen. Well, that's it for our first one. So thanks. And you know what? We look forward to having you come out and be with us right here at Quail Lake Church some Sunday. We'd love to have you here. We've got a great group of folks, and we'd love to have you be a part of the family. Our rule here is as soon as you come in the door, you're part of the Quail Lake family. We'd love to love you that way. Now, what I want to do is bless you like we bless the folks right here at Quail Lake each Sunday. 
So would you receive this now? Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Remember, God loves you. We do, too, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. All right, let's sing a favorite of mine. It's really appropriate in this time of Thanksgiving to think of all the ways that we can bless the Lord for the things that he has done for us. So let's sing 10,000 Reasons Together. Bless the Lord. Worship his holy name. See like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing. The song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the my soul, oh my soul, worship His soul. Ship your heart.